Bon. So, Kwe, Oki, bonjour, hello. On behalf of the members of Mount St. Vincent University, Department of Business and Tourism, my name is Jennifer Gee, and I'm an assistant professor working in the Department of Business and Tourism. I would like to begin by thanking you for being here today. It's great that we can come together for our 2021 annual Local Entrepreneur and Cultural Tourism Tour. As a descendant of the British settlers, I acknowledge and pay respect to the Indigenous people of the land from which we host today's meeting, the Ulnu Mi'kmaq people. I live and work on the ancestral, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I also pay respect to the knowledge embedded in the Indigenous custodian of this land and to the elders past, present, and future. In Canada today, um, we celebrate more than 50 Indigenous nations um, during uh, the month of June. Uh, this year, in 2020, on September 30th, we were able to have our first National Truth and Reconciliation Day. And in October, this month right now, we celebrate in Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq History Month. To gain a deeper, accurate understanding of Canada's true history, we encourage you all to read about and engage in as many Indigenous learning opportunities as possible. Before we begin today's virtual tour, I would like to remind you all that this event is being recorded. The event is learning passport eligible. And for this event to count as part of your bonus points towards the learning passport program, remember to complete the online corresponding survey within 48 hours after this event takes place. To reduce our chance of having a disruption during the session, uh, we have turned off your microphones and chat box options. We do have a list of questions pre-circulated to us from students, uh, which I will refer to today. If you have additional questions uh, for our guest speaker, you can email them to business at msvu.ca and we will make sure that Heather receives your questions and follows up with them after today's session. So today we are feeling very fortunate to have with us Heather Stevens, who is one of a number of managers at the Millbrook Cultural and Heritage Center. Heather is a Mi'kmaq woman who lives in Millbrook, Nova Scotia. Heather has been a manager of the Millbrook Cultural and Heritage Center for six years. Um, she is also a senior heritage interpreter. Heather's journey to where she is now has taken many twists and turns. In the beginning of her career, she would have never thought she would have been working at the Mi'kmaq Heritage, Heritage Center. Um, Heather's career started out, she went to school uh, to, begin, to be a vet. So she did an uh, animal sciences degree. Then she got a diploma in conflict management. After this, she, she obtained a diploma in horticulture and aquaculture. What amazing experiences. Um, after Heather's education, Heather worked as a manager for a land-based facility for four years. And then finally, she's settled herself here in the tourism uh, management area where she is today. Uh, Heather's told me that her job is wonderful. She gets to meet thousands of people from all over the world. One of the best uh, times she's had at the Millbrook, Millbrook Cultural and Heritage Center was when they had over 45 thousand people walk through their doors um, and that was only in the short period of time of a six-month season where they were there they're opened so when referring back to this experience Heather's told me that uh, to look at and reflect on how much she got to share and learn from people from around the world uh, there are not many people that can say that they've had that opportunity and she absolutely loves doing what she does so um, we really thank you for being here today, Heather, and showing us the center and letting us into a little bit more of your life experiences, which the students value so much and they can't just learn in the classroom. So without further ado, I welcome Heather Stevens to take over and begin her tour. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jennifer. Gwe, welly asi poog. Neen dalawisi, Heather. Basically what I said was hi and good morning. It's not morning now, but Let's just go with it. And then I said, my name is Heather. So um, I'm really excited about being here today. I'm 
looking at myself on my phone, it's kind of awkward. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so this is my first opportunity to teach a tourism, um, cultural tourism class or speak or whatever you want, want to call it. Um, so yes, I am very, very involved in my heritage center. Um, I am the manager here and um, we've done a number of different changes here. I don't know if very many of you have been here before, but the center was established in 2006. Um, I started working here in 2012 and uh, was full-time management in 2015. And at that point is when the Millbrook First Nations actually took over the center. And we are now fully run by uh, indigenous people. Um, so that's great. It's, it's, it's amazing. And everybody that comes through the door will get firsthand experience from the First Nations people from this community. Um, as everybody knows, everybody has their own story. And um, that's, you know, that's one um, thing that a lot of people like um, that they're actually hearing from a First Nations person on their perspective and, and such when they walk through our doors. So this center, um, I'm gonna actually flip it. I don't want you guys to see me anymore. Oh. Okay, so this center, I'm actually going to start from the very back here. So this is the big glue scap statue. Um, glue scap is 40 feet tall and he's an icon here. Everybody that drives by is like, oh, that's the glue scap statue. I got to stop and see what that's all about. Um, Glooscap is a mythological being or, or hero to our Mi'kmaq people. Legend is um, that he was actually created by three bolts of lightning that hit the Bay of Funde. And when he was created, uh, actually during the time that he was being created, he was learning from his surroundings, uh, learning such things from the animals as, you know, who got along, who didn't get along, you know, what the seasons were, um, you know, what food that, that the animals ate and what food was lacking, um, those type of things. So when the third lightning bolt hit the Bay of Fundy is when he was actually released from the bay. And that's when he actually lived amongst the people, or the animals, sorry, not the people. And so he would learn from them firsthand um, mm -hmm. who got along and who didn't get along and, and such. At some point, uh, Blue Scap is actually what we call a shapeshifter. So shape-shifting, if nobody really knows what that is, but most of you probably do. Um, so he would shape-shift into a butterfly. So if you look at him, he is 40 feet high. In our legends, he's 40 to 100 feet high. And so if you were to have seen a 40-foot man walking upon you, um, you probably weren't going to be very forthcoming with things that are going on and, and uh, asking for help. So he actually shape shifted into a butterfly. Uh, which he could actually listen to the animals without them knowing that he was actually listening to them. So there's thousands of legends, um, but uh, yeah. So I'm going to start here because he's the icon for the center. So then I'm going to come turn around. And there's a number of different panels here um, that tell about since Europeans, uh, which gives you a history of when the, uh, before 1600 and the Europeans came here. It, uh, Gives you that type of history on, on what our, I'm gonna figure out this camera here, there. Um, so yeah, our, our history before contact. Uh, you just, yeah, you're good, Heather. Oh um, yep. well, yeah, so that's what this panel is all about. Um, I don't really discuss a whole lot of the panels with the people that walk through the door because this is a time for them to actually take their time and read and um, ingest everything that they're reading. So this one here is Millbrook Mi'kmaq Then. So what this is talking about is how the Millbrook First Nations community was moved a number of different times. So we actually were along the Salmon River for a lot of our, our um, community community time together. And what happened was the government actually found out that we were thriving. And um, so they actually moved us from that particular area and moved us in the center of Truro where Victoria Park is. At that point in time, they actually um, called that area, we called that area Christmas Island. And then of course, uh, the government found out that we could actually survive there because the water was flowing through Victoria Park and they didn't like that so much. 
So in uh, December, it was December 6th, 1886, is when we were finally moved here to what you guys see now as Millbrook. Um, and why they moved us here is because the land here was, there's no water close by. We definitely have rock everywhere that we are. So in their eyes, we weren't gonna succeed mm -hmm. at all. So that's why they moved us here. But lo and behold, they were wrong. Uh, Millbrook had very good leadership and such. So we built up from what they thought we weren't going to. Um, so then, oh, I'm gonna show you this canoe. This canoe is a 14 foot canoe, birch bark canoe, made by a man by the name of Todd Labrador. Todd Labrador uh, learned the craft of birch bark making from his father. And he is now uh, passing on that art to um, his daughter and his grandchildren. So, yep, this is made out of birch bark. There's lacing that you see here for the birch bark uh, canoe. That is actually black spruce roots. So they're roots of a tree that come in like a, it looks like a big, kind of looks like a banana, okay? And so we would boil the, the root in water and depending on what it is that we wanted to use the spruce roots for, we would peel it just like you would a banana peel, but the banana peel would continuously be peeled until we got to the size of the root that we wanted to do certain things. Inside of this canoe, is actually cedar ribbing. So we would use cedar uh, to do the ribbing inside of it. The canoe itself weighs about 50 pounds. So it can be carried by one or two people. It's a, it's a um, family. So the father would sit in the front, the children in the middle, and the mother at the very end. Um, so there's two oars. Depending on um, who would be doing most of the paddling, this is made out of rock maple. And um, those would be for the man because they're a heavier paddle. And then if it was a woman, it would have been made out of like um, black ash. So it's a lighter wood. So basically it was sexist really is what it was. They're basically saying that women weren't strong even though we were the ones that did most of the work. Um, yeah, we did. The men just went out and hunted and we did everything else. Um, just like most First Nations. So this is my veterans wall. So the veterans wall is very significant in the fact that the First Nations people were not able to um, serve in the military until like later in life. So um, not later in life, I guess it was in, uh, what was it? July 19th, 1776 is when we actually signed an agreement with the Watertown, uh, with Watertown, Massachusetts, it's called the Treaty of Watertown. So if you look there, that is basically explaining the fact that without us signing this treaty with the United States, the Mi'kmaq people, First Nations people in general, would lose their status as being a First Nations person. Should we have any education over and above, um, you know, like a grade three or four? Um, so we couldn't go to post-secondary school. We couldn't become anything in life without losing the identity of our people. But now, uh, we have very, we have a, a vast number of First Nations uh, people that have served in the U.S. Army mm -hmm. and the U.S. Marines. Um, and we also have like a cenotaph here that, um, I gotta go back this way, a cenotaph that actually talks about all of our um, veterans um, that have since passed. So on the memorial, we also have RCMP. RCMP was a, an organization that, as we all know, has been around here for a very long time. But we weren't actually allowed to join the R RCMP until 1990. Um, so that was not too long ago, actually, you know, and uh, it was basically because they didn't find any value in us. Um, and, and a lot of the things they still don't find any value in us, um, even though we've been here for, for 13,600 years. You know, and it's kind of unfortunate, you know, we didn't even become U.S. citizens until 1960, or U.S. citizens, Canadian citizens until 1960. So think about that. I mean, that wasn't very long ago, and we've been here for, what, 13,600 years. So we have lots of people on the wall here. Um, and so these are um, people that have served or have since passed after serving uh, from different communities. Um, so that's our veterans wall. Then we also have this thing called a shaving horse right here. 
So shaving hearse is something that's more modern. Um, this one in particular was in 1953, was made in 1953, um, and it was by an elder by the name of William Gugu. So basically what it is, is it's a vice that will help uh, us to split black ash into the um, splints that you see in the baskets here. So the splints, whoop, the splints here are actually made from black ash. Um, I'm gonna bring you over. Sorry guys, if you guys get dizzy, I'm actually gonna bring you over and show you what the black ash actually looks like when it's split. So this is what it, what it looks like when it's split. So if you look, they actually have um, splints is what it is. So at the very bottom here that you see, they actually continue the splint on and just peel it down. So depending on how thick or how long you want it, you just keep going. This is actually called a jikamogen in our language, which is in translation, a rattle. Um, so it was something that we would do. We would play, it sounds like a spoon or a rattle. Um, this is what we would use for our um, cultural dances and festivities um, instead of the drum. So this is made out of wood. And at one point or another, we weren't allowed to, and and still, you know, not too long ago, actually, we weren't allowed to practice our, our traditions, our dance, our singing. So this was easy enough for us to make and should an Indian agent or an RCMP mm -hmm. officer come about, we could actually take it and throw it in the fire so that, that we couldn't uh, be penalized or punished for practicing something that we should be allowed to practice anyway. Um, so yes, so that's to help us to make the splints for our baskets, okay? Now I'm gonna actually bring you over here. Oh, I have a guest. Oh, we have two. <laughs> I'm actually gonna start you over here where the early creations are. So early creations are things that our Mi'kmaq people did way before contact. So in here we have arrowheads and spearheads. Um, we gotta figure out how to do this. Okay, so in this section here, when I was speaking in front of the house, I was referring to 7,500 year old uh, arrowheads and spearheads. Well, that's exactly what we have. I don't know how close I can actually get before it gets blurry. But if you look at the second row down, um, and I don't know how it goes in my screen, but it's kind of like over here, there are the 7,500 year old uh, arrowheads. So that's the oldest artifact that we have here in the museum. Below that are moose um, teeth and beaver teeth we would use for like sewing and fishing. And then down below that are like, um, it's called a stone etzel and a stone axe. So those are just things that we would use just as we would use an axe today. Over here, we have a hat and a robe. The robe is made out of a moose hide and it's got lots of paintings and drawings on it. That is actually done by a mineral called ochre. So ochre is a mineral that you would find along the beaches. And this in particular is red and black ochre that is used on this. The red is actually got a different, a couple different person, uh, personalities, oh my goodness. Um, it's got a couple different um, properties. The red ochre is actually used, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term red Indians. Well, we actually were red when they seen us. And it was because we actually covered ourselves in that type of mineral. Um, mainly because it was like a bug repellent in a sunscreen for us. So it would come off over time, but it would stain our skin. So lo and behold, that's why they would call us red Indians. Um, if you look down here, here in particular, these are mink. Um, mink were used for pockets for our people. We didn't have mm -hmm. pockets, right? So we used whatever we could. Um, the meat we definitely would use, but there's not a whole lot of meat on a, on a mink. So we would actually use the pelt for that purpose um, to put like berries and our tools and those type of things inside of it. Over here, we actually have things made out of cattails. So these are the cattail um, ends or stems here. And we would actually weave things out of the cattail stems. So we have right there is a fishing basket. 
And then above here is just a depiction of what would be inside of our wigwam for a door. That's not actually what we would do because holy man, that would be hard to get into. Then below this are just mats, different types of mats that we would use. So that's a mat and that's a mat um, for entrance into our wigwam, okay? And then over here, we actually have a display case that has birch bark um, containers in it. So the birch bark containers are things that we actually moved away. Uh, we moved away from pottery to actually start making birch bark. Birch bark, as you see, has little etchings and stuff in it. Those were just for fun, just to do. Um, but the properties of birch bark are um, what it was that we went to. Properties of birch bark are the fact that it's, it's water resistant, bug resistant mold resistant um, and it's light. So we could store food in it. And when we did, we would store it underground because the bugs wouldn't come into it. Um, mold wouldn't happen. Um, so that's why we actually moved away from pottery because pottery would actually break down over time with heat and movement. Um, and then when you move back, when you move on to this side, as you guys can see, there's a lacrosse a la um, stick. And just below that, I don't know if you guys can see it because of the light, there's actually a hockey stick in here. This hockey stick is over 100 years old um, and it was made by a community member by the name of Alec Cope here in our community. In the very back here, ooh, I gotta position my finger the right way. This is a Waltez board. Waltez is an old um, ancient game of chance. Um, it could be used for settling disagreements, or just for fun. So what it is, is the bowl is actually made out of a burl of a tree. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a tree before, but it has like a bump on the outside of it. Kind of looks like a, like, a, like a pimple or a zit. But we would actually cut that off and hollow it out a little bit and use it for a bowl. The sticks are made out of black ash or poplar. And then the dice, and I know you guys can't see the dice in this one, um, but the dice are made out of kneecaps of a, of a like a, Oh my goodness, escaped me. A moose or a walrus or um, I don't know, bigger animals. We would use the bones or the, or the um, tusks to make our um, dice. When you move over here, you'll have a cradle board. The cradle board is something that we would carry our babies in. Um, if you look on the sides of it, um, right there up, whoop, right there. There's actually like a little nubby that sticks out and there's another one on the other side. That was actually used to help us to hang our children in a tree um, because if our back was um, turned, um, then the chances are something would attack our children. So we would actually hang it up in a tree. Um, I know it sounds kind of corny, but it's kind of cool. Then we actually have a snowshoe. The snowshoe is very old. Snowshoe is something that we had invented um, to help us to walk on the snow. The inside of that is made out of sinew. The sinew is the muscle fibers and tendons of an animal, um, which is very, very strong. Um, so we would use the sinew and then the, the rim is black ash. Okay, I'm gonna move you. These are more panel boards. Traveling light just basically talks about, um, oh, it's in two official lang two, two languages, English and Mi'kmaq. Um, so this is traveling light. This is talking about what I just spoke about, how we traveled light, we had birch bark, and we only carried what we needed. Um, this here is actually talking about birth, life, and beyond. This, in, in a nutshell, basically talks about how our life um, is, is kind of laid out. And when we are born, when we get married, and um, when we become, a, not me, but when a boy becomes a man, and marriage and then death. So it talks about stuff like that. Um, so it's very interesting. A lot of people like that. I like to um, pick on one of my coworkers, actually one of my workers, his name is Jeff. He's never killed a moose before in his life. So I like to say he's not even a man. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so here we are at Porcupine Co Baskets. So Porcupine, um, at the very beginning when we would do Porcupine Co Baskets, they were actually done for dowry. So what that means is, um, when I talked about marriage, marriage happened when it was the boy would come live with the girl for a year. And the father would learn what that man could actually do to 
sustain his family, his wife and his children. And so after the year, the mother and father in community or, and yeah, in the community would decide whether or not the, the man is um, good enough for his daughter. And then if it is, or he is not yet, if he is, then the actual basket is something that the mother would put together and put things meaningful from her family in it because the woman would come back uh, mm -hmm. to the actual uh, family again. She would see them again in like festivals, like celebrations, like um, uh, weddings and births and uh, in our death. Um, so she would see them sometimes, but not very often. So that's what they initially were for. Um, but over time, as the Europeans came upon us, they liked them and wanted them for decoration and for status, um, saying, you know, look what I've got. It cost me such and such. Then over time, um, we moved away from, we still do quill work. I do quill work myself, um, but it's not as prevalent as it was before. Now, there's actually beading. So this is um, some of the beading stuff that we have here, right? Ooh here up right there is a woman's peaked hat um, the designs on it actually match the woman that would be wearing it if you look at it it looks like there's like like a like a curve and then a flat area then another curve well that actually is what we call a double curve motif that is distinctive for the Mi'kmaq people it's it's life is what it is so at the very beginning of the curve is when you're born and then on the very bottom is when you're growing up and you're experiencing life, you're having your children, you're living where you're living. And on the very end, as it starts to curl up again is when you are being looked after um, by your children and, and uh, then you die. Um, the designs inside of the double curve motif all are um, represented, representative for what the woman um, has, where they live, do they live by the woods, do they have five children, four children, how many children do they have? Um, just different things that actually talk about that woman in particular. Then we have just a beadwork here. So this is a big purse, a wallet, uh, um, a suspender. Then we have some moccasin toes, those type of things. So this is just showing a little bit of our work. I'm a beater as well. And I like the smaller beads because you can do so much better with them. It's so much more detailed. Then when I mentioned about the baskets, here are some baskets for our people. So I gotta figure out how to do this camera thing. So over on your far, or on your left, I think, um, there's working baskets. So in the very top of the basket, there is a potato basket. Then we have a fishing creel that has like the strap around it. Then the other one that has a handle is what we would use after contact when they showed us how to plant crops. And then the very bottom is a berry basket to pick like blackberries and strawberries and such. Uh, when I move over this way, these are what we call whimsies or things for fun. If you look at the very top row, those are actually flowers made out of wood. So we have birch bark flower mm -hmm. rope, actually it's a rose. And then the rest of them are made out of black ash. The basket of course is black ash. And then if you look down here, they're very tiny. These baskets were, as I say, just for decoration, just for fun. Um, so yeah, there's some of the tools here. Right there is called a crooked knife. And then the one there is the one, it's a gauge is what they call it. So you can cut your splints in different sizes to make the different size baskets, okay? Then we move over here. Here is what we call ornate or in our language, jigajig which is in translation, periwinkle shells. So if you look at this basket in particular, I don't know if you know what periwinkle shells are, but periwinkle shells are, are um, growths or shells that are on rocks in, in and around the ocean. So that's what we would have seen. So that's what we would have done. Here, ooh, here is called a ribbon, a ribbon basket. And it just looks just like that, a ribbon. Some of our baskets are actually lined and, and uh, topped with sweetgrass. Sweetgrass is one of our medicines. The sweetgrass also has a property in the fact that if you were to store um, cloth inside of a basket, let's say you have a basket that you want to store tie in or your napkins in, um, it is moth resistant. 
Um, so moths don't like sweet grass. But sweet grass smells like cinnamon. I love the smell of sweet grass. And then here we have a panel board that's called the meaning of life. And it talks about our very first eight, or it's called a seven point star actually. The eight point star didn't come about until after um, discussions and an agreement with the crown, uh, the queen. And that was the eight point in our before seven point star. Um, so then I'm gonna move on to the, I'll show you those in a second. Um, this is a regalia. Gosh, I hate the lighting. I hope the lighting's okay. This is a regalia whoop, that I am actually going whoop, to Australia to repatriate. Um, exciting for me. It was underneath that bill C391 um, that when I went to the House of Commons, we discussed. Um, but I am going without that bill being passed. Yay for me. I'm so excited. Um, so I actually got the go ahead from Museum Victoria. Um, the year, uh, I guess it was in November of the year before when COVID hit. Um, it was quite the um, meeting that I had with them over Zoom where they tricked me at first and then they hit me with it's coming home. Um, and I just cried and bawled and all those things. But it's been a long go for me. Um, prior to me working here, the Heritage Center um, were, was trying to get it, but uh, Museum Victoria knew that they were trying to get it for um, monetary gain, economic gain, uh, where in the fact that I don't, I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing it for cultural significance, cultural gain, um, connections that were lost. This regalia was made in 1843 um, and bought by a man by the name of Samuel Huey. And uh, basically what he was doing was that he thought that our our craft and our traditions were going to die. So he ended up buying it and leaving it to Museum Victoria or the Melbourne Museum. And then uh, I got wind of it and decided that I wasn't gonna let it stay there. And now it's coming home. The borders for um, Australia are opening up in November and I'm hoping that I get the go ahead to go down. Probably not until January, but I'm so stoked. The government is so excited. Our community is excited. Um, all Mi'kmaq uh, First Nations communities are excited. It's going to be a big deal. Um, this is the last display case that I'm going to show. This is called Contemporary Creations. So these are things that our Mi'kmaq people, not all the things that our Mi'kmaq people are doing, but some of the things that our Mi'kmaq people are doing now. The picture there that you see uh, was our former chief, Lawrence Paul. Lawrence Paul actually um, is the one that envisioned this museum. Uh, to be what it is. And so without his vision, this, this center wouldn't be here. Um, so we have him to thank. The actual uh, headdress that he has on is a war bonnet that was given to him. It's not something that our First Nations people wear. Our First Nations people wear a headdress that has eagle feathers that are sticking straight up in the air. And I will show our chief that we have today in that particular headdress in just a moment. Um, so some of our art here, some of you guys may know his name is Alan Silliboy. Um, so we have some of his art. We have another community member, Gerald Glode, his art. And then we have Patsy Paul Martin. She is our linguistic uh, person. She is involved in the educational system and she is developing books and is a spearhead in getting our language into our schooling system. Um, then we have Leonard Paul. He just likes to do charcoal and pencil drawings as well as um, like nature drawings and such. Um, yeah, so then we have another quill basket here. Um, so things are still going with that type of um, art. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a quill basket maker too, but that's not mine. Um, but yeah, so then as I mentioned, I'm actually gonna show you these two art pieces. So this one in particular first, this one is actually um, an art piece that was done by, um, what is their name? I love that. It's a, the, can't remember. Um, it's a La, La Michelle Jean Foundation. Um, but the, basically what it is, is it's a piece of art that has something to do with residential schools. So what they did is they had youth um, 
you know, middle-aged people and seniors and elders come together and talk about what it is that they feel um, that First Nations people have lost because of the residential residential school systems. And so each one of these tiles, I don't know if I can get in on them or not. Some of these tiles actually show pictures of the residential school. And some of them show pictures of actual people that attended the residential school. Um, so each one of these were, were placed on this piece of art. And um, in recognition of what our people had been through. If you look at the animals on our um, art piece here, they are the seven animals that go along with our seven sacred teachings. Um, so that's why those are in there. And then of course the eagle feathers. So eagle feathers are very significant to all First Nations people. They're a high honor to receive and a gift. And then this one was actually done by here, uh, the students here at the, at the Heritage Center. So we would have elementary school te uh, teachers bring their schools or their classes to our center. And at the time, um, in 2017, um, we were talking about residential schools a lot in the schooling systems, um, but the children just basically didn't really have a whole understanding until they came here and we kind of had a one-on-one -on -one talk with them and such. And after our talk with them, we gave them tiles and the students would do something on each one of the tiles that they felt that the children were lacking or didn't have because they were taken away and put into schools. So these ones here, you can actually see some of the stuff. It's like love and family and sports. A lot of it is family and playing and love, um, laughing, you know, just all the different things that these children have in their life and they understand that our children didn't have. Um, so with all the tiles were done, I had tasked my summer employees to develop something that represents us as Mi'kmaq people and us as First Nations people. So they took all of the tiles and they developed this turtle. This turtle represents all of North America and the eight point star represents the, the Mi'kmaq people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, yeah, I don't really have much more to, to show except that the totem pole here is something that the Mi'kmaq people don't normally do. This is a contemporary art piece that was done by a Wolustic man or a man um, that was uh, Maliseet. So he lived in New Brunswick, went out West, learned the totem pole making tradition and brought it back here to Mi'kmaq uh, where he did something that um, told a story for the Mi'kmaq people. Um, so on the very bottom, you'll see that there's a turtle. I gotta see how it'll go here. Yeah. So here there's a turtle, which, a, which represents Turtle Island. On the side, you'll see a squiggly thing, which is a fiddlehead. Fiddleheads are something that we eat still today. I do, but uh, Jeff doesn't, he doesn't like veggies. Um, so they're really good. It's an immature fern that grows in the, in the woods. Above that is Glooscap, the man that I talked about outside. Um, I love his six pack. Look at that six pack there. Ooh, I like it. So then above him is, um, a horned serpent. In our language, we call Japishkam. Japishkam in our language translation is just a serpent, a snake. So Japishkam would actually go underneath the Earth's crust, create earthquakes and tremors, and cause havoc on our Mi'kmaq people. So Glooscap, being who he was and what he was about, took a hold of Japishkam and put him to sleep, which we no longer have earthquakes here. Above that is a chief, just like all First Nations people, we have a chief, and on his head is what we would have for a traditional headdress. As I mentioned, our eagle feathers are pointing straight up in the air, and so that's what um, our headdress typically would be. Above that is a salmon. So the salmon represents 90% of our diet. Uh, we lived along the waterways. Um, so that's basically what we did. We lived off the water. Anything that came out of the water, we ate. Mind you, I don't eat everything that comes out of the water now. <laughs> uh, above that is the eagle. 
The eagle represents love in our seven sacred teachings. He also represents um, a carrier for us. So when we actually talk to our creator, he is the one that carries our, our um, thoughts and our prayers from us to our creator to be uh, transferred to him or her or whoever it is. Um, and then in the museum, we have um, petroglyphs or hier hieroglyphics that were actually taken from Kejimakuji National Park. Um, they actually are about 11,000 years old. What they did is they transposed them and we have a local artist, Teresa Marshall, had done them in wrought iron and we have them displayed. Mm -hmm. We have eight of them displayed here in the museum. So this in particular is a caribou. We no longer have caribou here. At one time we did, um, but the deer brought over the tick which gave Lyme disease and killed our, our caribou. Sorry about the, the talking in the background. We are still functioning today. Um, so I have visitors coming in and out. Um, ooh, how do I do this? Okay, here um, is a whale. Um, the whale is actually something that we would, wouldn't so much harvest, um, but when we did, it was for the, like the blubber and the fat and those type of things to sustain us in the winter time. Now here is a hunter. Um, actually, it's a fisherman. He's got a He's got a spear there. And so he would be um, uh, fishing for eel uh, with that type of spear. And here we have a Mi'kmaq woman. She's a dancer. Um, you can tell that she's a woman because she has a dress on. And the very top, if you noticed, uh, I spoke about the peaked hat and that's what she has on her head. Um, and then here we have a moose. As you know, we still have moose here. Um, so it's just basically something that we would have had around here and we would have seen it. So those are things that we basically documented in stone. Okay, so here, uh, we have a man with a backpack on. I'm not exactly sure as to what it is that he was going for, but I know that it was a man with a backpack. And then the very last, no, not the last one. This is a pheasant. Uh, pheasants are things that we see all the time around here. Um, so it's just a drawing of a pheasant. And then the last one is this one. This is ooh, our fisherman in a, in a canoe. Um, so yeah, other than that, I really don't have a whole, whole lot. To, oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm going to show you guys our living village. <clears throat> So this living village actually was developed in about 2016. Um, so this is something that I envisioned to have in this area. Prior to Millbrook taking it over, it was a tourist bureau um, with leaflets from all over Nova Scotia, um, but I didn't want that. I decided to change it into what it is now. So in front of you, you see a wigwam. The wigwam is something that we had as staff um, worked with Todd Labrador to build. So each one of us had actually helped to build this wigwam. The wigwam has birch bark on the outside. And um, these are birch trees holding down the, the birch bark. Inside of it is a moose, a moose hide. If I bring you in, I'm not sure if I can bring you in or not. I want to try. It might be too dark for you. you know? So mm -hmm. this is the inside of the actual wigwam. So if you look at the very top, it allows for air exchange in and out. This is a summer settlement. So we would have an entire family and an extended family inside of this wigwam. So the adults would sleep on the outside and the children would sleep on the inside. So we would keep them safe. The door wouldn't be open like this. I just have it open because it's ease of access for people to go in and out of the wigwam. Um, normally, it would be an, either another piece of birch bark or a piece of hide. Um, so in here, I have a um, smaller version of some of the animals that um, we would um, eat or deal with um, and see every day. So here is a baby black bear. I have them on a smaller scale because I'm limited with space. So um, these are all taxidermied animals. Some of them were donated and some of them I had to go and get. But this is a black bear in our language. It's Muin. Um, and then up here is, 
is just a goose. You guys all probably seen goose before. This is called Cynamic. And then here is an eagle, which in our language is Gipu. Then down here I have, whoop, I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. Yeah, there you go, is a bobcat. So the bobcat is just a little one, like I had said, it has to be babies. Oh, and I have little panels too here that actually help people to phonetically say what a bobcat is in our language. So this one is Ipka Ju Ouch. Ipka Ju Ouch is a bobcat. And then, as I mentioned, there's the eagle, Gipu. Then this is a caribou. So the caribou is something uh, that, like I said, is no longer here with us. The caribou in our language is Dalabu, which in translation is snow shoveler. So if you look at his antlers, the antlers are very pronounced in the very front. So when we would see them foraging in the winter time, they would use their nose and their antlers to push the snow back and forth, which is why we call them snow shovelers or gipu or gullabu. Okay. Then, as you see, we have moose. This is a female moose, and then that's the bull moose. These moose were actually hunted by youth here in our community. So the youth went out with our elders and learned the traditional ways of harvesting and hunting our moose. Um, and so when the meat was um, um, done. They give it out to our elders and then elders are served. Elders are giving anything that they need and as much as they want. And then it goes out to the needy in our community. And then if there's anything left, then um, any other community member can go and get the food. Uh, but mainly it's, it's to help the people. Um, mm -hmm. Like our elders are, are always our first people to help out. Um, and then down here is a loon. The loon is actually in our in our stories is a messenger for Glooscap. So he, the call that he has, um, is supposed to be the sound that he is sending to Glooscap for a message. In our language, that's Guimu. Then here we have a coyote, and he's hunting the pheasants. Um, in our language, it's Uukwedge. Oh, and then over here. I have a red-tailed fox, or fox, oh my goodness, red-tailed hawk. <laughs> so, um, so the red-tailed hawk is something that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a hunter and we watch and learn from the hawk to see where the food is um, and such. So in our language, it's bivouac. Then we have a little beaver down here, um, gobit. Here we have a porcupine, Madawes. And then we have the last one is a large owl. He is actually a barn owl. I think that's what they're called. And um, in our language is Gugugues. Okay, so this is our area here. Um, and I love it. A lot of people love it. They can come in and they, you know, have some time. They actually sit in there for a while. It's it's quite, it's quite appealing for me to go in there every once in a while too, and just kind of lay there and regroup. So yeah. Anyway, is there any uh, Jennifer? I'm done. Um, if there's any other questions or anything that you think I should look at, um, we also have a gift shop here. The gift shop is um, First Nations Arts and Crafts from west to east. And so I try to get all authentic um, as much as I can from our Mi'kmaq people. Sometimes it's hard to do, but uh, you know we try our best to do what we can do. So yeah. All right, Jennifer, what do I do now? You just keep doing what you're doing because um, I am so impressed. Uh, we will do question periods now, Heather, but um, I can't thank you enough for providing with us with such an engaging and eloquent um, description of the last thir some of the artifacts that came out of the last 13,000, close to 14,000 years. Um, feeling very, very um, appreciative of how this information that's been shared with us and that I unfortunately didn't learn growing up in school here in Nova Scotia. So um, thank you again for that. And I just have some questions that have been provided to us from some of the students. All right. 
So I'll just begin with a question from Hannah Huntley, who attended a tour in the Millbrook Book Heritage Center back in 2018. And um, she was saying that um, you mentioned that there is um, an archaeological, but back when you, did you give the tour? Maybe you did, because she's saying when you gave the tour, there was an archaeological dig in Debert where artifacts have been found um, that aren't yet in the center. So since 20, 2018, have any of these artifacts been placed in the center? And if so, which ones? No, unfortunately, there haven't been. Um, they're still digging out in Mi'kmaq de Burt. Um, so right now, every artifact that's pulled from there is being housed at the Halifax Museum, the Museum of History in Halifax, being housed out back. Um, being cared for by an Indigenous curator, um, so they are being well taken care of, but um, not yet. And a lot of those actual artifacts are going to be going to our new um, cultural centre out in Mi'kmaq Way de Burt, um, once it's built. So they're going to be much bigger um, and going to have much more area to be able to house a lot of those. And that's okay. Um, I'm going to house some of the stuff here, but since they have a much bigger area and and such, then it's it's better for them to be where they actually came from. Okay, yeah. well, that's good to know. And it's good to know that the centers are growing and uh, thriving. So that's that's a good good thing. I also heard that um, the Museum of Natural History is upgrading their center. Do you know anything about that? No. Okay. It was just last couple of days I read something there. So um, I didn't know if you had any insights on that. No. All right. So the next question, we had um, some students that were really interested in this. Um, your work with uh, Bill C391, you went up to Ottawa and spoke to the government, federal government with a local MLA who supported this initiative. So what prompted you to start this movement and put your efforts um, into getting this regalia back to Canada? Um, how much time do you have? Uh, well, <laughs> I wish we had, we had class doesn't stop until 1.15 and we're at 1.56. Okay, so uh, long story short, um, in 2012, when I did my co-op position here at the Heritage Center, um, I noticed that it was just a picture in, in a display case and it didn't sit well with me. So I went to the um, people in charge and asked them why, and they said, it's none of your business. Um, because mm -hmm. I wasn't in the position to do anything anyway. So when Millbrook took it over in 2015, that's when I started to, to actually dig in and understand why that regalia wasn't here. Um, and I fully and utterly understand why um, Museum Victoria did not allow it to come here. And it was basically because um, they wanted it for the wrong reasons. They wanted it for economic gain. Um, and as I mentioned over in the display case, I didn't want it for economic gain. And so when Melbourne or Museum Victoria, um, actually when Bill Casey came um, is when it actually started to flourish. And I didn't really think he was actually telling me the truth that he was going to do a private member's bill. You know, he's a, he's a political man and I just thought he was just blowing hot air. Um, so when he said that, I was like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. And then when I got a call from his assistant in December of that year, because he was at the center in October. So when he came in, or I got a call from um, his, his uh, assistant in December saying that Bill wanted to meet with me on a private member's bill. I was like, I don't even know what that is, um, but okay. So um, see, I'm not political, you know, those type of things. So I don't really understand those things. Um, so when he came and talked to me about developing a private member's bill, I was like, okay, what is it? And he told me what it was and wanted to know if I would be a part of that, if I could be named in it and be a part of it. And I basically said, well, I got to read it. I got to understand it. And so I did. And he, uh, we met again and I told him, yeah, okay. You know, I fully support what you're doing. He's like, yay. And then we moved on and then we went, he went to the house, talked for two minutes and 37 seconds. And then after that, he, uh, he, uh, um, had me invited to the house and so and had me invited to the house and um, I couldn't believe it when I got the email from the house saying that they wanted me to be there 
and speak to them about the private members bill. I was like, you got to be kidding me. But then when I got there, I was, it was so surreal. I had to actually meet Brian Adams that day. Um, so I know, right? I got to take a picture with him and everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a day that I wasn't there for me. I was there for all of, our, uh, all of the First Nations people. And I was there because that bill will help out so many other um, First Nations communities to get back what, right, what's rightfully theirs. Um, I, I don't need uh, the bill to be able to get the regalia back, which is great. Um, you know, Mel, uh, Museum Victoria is very um, animate on getting it back here now because they know um, I want it for the right reasons. So, yeah, I hope that answered your question, Jennifer. Yeah, that's excellent. And you did note earlier on during your tour that the bill has not been passed yet, but that's great that you can make your mm -hmm. way over to, is it Melbourne? And yeah. pick up that item. That's just so special. And you'll get a lot of social media attention, I think, which will just help move this cause along maybe more, mm -hmm. um, more rapidly, right? Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So we have um, another question here um, from Carly Mitchell. And uh, Carly was wondering, like, are there more artifacts there that um, people are more drawn to? Is there like a really popular artifact that people uh, talk about when they visit the center or do they just enjoy uh, looking at all the different artifacts? I think they are drawn to towards our porcupine quill um, baskets. I think that's a draw for a lot of people to go in, and uh, admire and understand because um, when they come in and they're standing around that display case and I see them, I make my way over to them and I start speaking to them about, you know, what they are and why we did them and how the process is of doing them. And that just um, gives us that additional connection that I think they're looking for. Um, other than that, I mean, everybody likes what's in here, but I think the main focus, I know when we had tour buses and such, the main focus was our quill work. Um, they loved it. Yeah. And you said that people aren't doing that as much anymore. Is that correct? What's that? Oh, quill, quill work. Quill, yeah. yeah. No, not at all, really. I mean, birch bark itself is hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, so birch bark is our base for quill work, for the quill baskets. Um, okay. So birch bark itself is hard to come by. And is this true that when you're gathering the quills from the porcupine, you put a blanket over them? Do you know anything about the process? I could never do that right. Okay. Um, but there is a process that, that people, you know, when they get the knack, they get the knack. I can't do it. I don't understand how to do it. Um, so my quills I get from Department of Natural Resources from Roadkill. Um, so I just basically freeze, freeze the porcupine and then skin it and then pull the quills out of that. Um, it's much easier when it's frozen. Um, but I don't know how to do it with blanket. Okay. So you nope. get, ro you get road quills. Road quills. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I meant to tell you too, when you're like, you're going through the tour and you're on your own speaking and it's a virtual tour, right? Um, I was smiling and laughing when you were, when you were giving your little side notes and when you're <laughs> pointing to everything in the cases, we could see it perfectly. I okay. can't believe that um, you took us in a wigwam today. Like that's pretty spectacular. Like it was so <laughs> clear and your voice was just wonderful. So that's really, oh, really, really great. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. You'll get to see the recording and you'll see how wonderful it is. Um, so another question here is from Peter Hardisky. And uh, Peter's asking a more general question about Indigenous tourism. So because you're working in that, that sector, uh, what are some of the barriers when it comes to developing Indigenous tourism experiences? Yeah, it all depends on location. Um, some of the barriers that I have are the fact that I am, I've got a highway running beside me um, and then I've got a power center on the other side of me. Um, so I'm very limited on what I could do outside of my building um, because of the traffic, the noise. Um, so that's one of my barriers. Um, and the fact that if I wanted to do, you know, medicine walks, like we have medicine being, you know, it's planted outside, but to have our discussion with people outside, it's like, it's crazy because of the traffic from the highway. Um, and, you know, just to have 
you know, any type of storytelling or gathering outside, it's, it's impossible because of the, the highway. Another one of the barriers are um, the understanding from government. The understanding from government as to how important Indigenous tourism is um, and how important it is to um, expand it and um, have the programming for Indigenous um, people to become interpreters and to become responsible for things that are rightfully theirs. Um, there's not very many Indigenous tourism courses uh, just for Indigenous people. Um, there are cultural tourism, but not Indigenous tourism, um, which is something that we're lacking. And I think that would benefit a lot of our people because even though a lot of our people are Indigenous, they don't know a whole lot about themselves, um, mainly because they weren't taught, because being taught our history was something that our elders didn't find value in because of things that have happened to us in the past, right? Um, sorry, I'm the only one here right now. So when somebody walks in, I got to look. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many barriers and the location is one of the ones that a lot of our First Nations people have in the fact that when the government placed us in reservations, they placed, in, placed us in places where it's hard to get to um, for, for traffic and such to get to those certain destinations because they didn't want us to succeed. They didn't want us to be in the forefront. So those are some of the barriers. It's an excellent answer. Thank you. So practical as, as everything that's coming along with this tour is. So thank you. Um, Christian asked um, that he looks at the website and um, sees that the tour, uh, you, what kind of tourists are you attracting to the center? Is there, are they from different countries? Is it a certain type of luxury mm -hmm. traveler or a cultural, probably a cultural traveler, right? But do you, do you get a sense that there's a certain type of demographic that's being attracted to the Millbrook Cultural Heritage Center? Um, um, well, when we first opened up in 2015, we really didn't have a whole lot of, um, we didn't have a whole lot of um, bus, bus traffic. And so we were mainly attracting just people that are on the road. I have to go into the theater because I have too much going on out there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so um, at, the first, at the first part of it, it was basically, you know, walk-in traffic. And then as I got my feet wet, I started to understand what it is that I was trying to target. And what I was trying to target was definitely people interested in, in our history and our culture. Um, and tour buses that had that in their itinerary was something that I was actually focusing on because tour buses have so many people that travel with them and the money's there, you know, and the vast amount of people that are interested now in what's going on in First Nations history and culture is growing. Um, so that's who I have mainly started to focus on. I mean, uh, at the very beginning, like I said, it was like trial and error as to who I was trying to attract. You know, I would advertise everywhere to get hardly anybody to come in um, from Nova Scotia. I'm getting so many people from the United States. I get people from Australia, Europe, China, Germany. I get people from all over the world um, more so than I do from people from Canada. Um, and it's unfortunate, but that's, that's my market. That's really interesting. I, I was surprised. I'm surprised to hear that. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that answer. Um, moving on to, uh, let's see, uh, Bram Preet uh, was talking about some of the difficulties or challenges you faced while thinking of new ideas to get more people attracted towards the culture or what strategies have you implemented or applied um, to get more people to visit the centers. So you spoke about reaching out to the tour operators and getting tour buses. Has there been anything else you've done? Or maybe we can tie into another question from Jan and uh, Mary Faye about um, COVID and how that's impacted things at the center. Yeah. Okay. So what have I done to increase? Um, so I've just basically, I've added things like our living village I've added, you know, that's more of a hands-on, more of a understanding where they can come in, you know, look at them, read about them, go into the wigwam, 
get that type of experience. I am limited in space and the ability to do much here at the Heritage Center um, with changing things up. Mm -hmm. um, so my vision is to have more um, hands-on um, here to allow people to feel, you know, experience different things. Um, so I'm hoping that I can get funding to be able to extend the actual center to be able to have that outlet where people can go and experience different things on their own time and understand it on their own time with us, of course. Um, so pre-COVID or during COVID, um, it really sucked here, to be frank. Um, you know, you know, we were here, we were working, and um, I don't really understand why we were. Uh, mainly because we weren't allowed to have anybody come in. Um, you know, I had lots of Zoom little thingies going on, but um, if it wasn't for the government allowing us to have COVID money to sustain ourselves during the six months, then we wouldn't have been open. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a blessing that we got the money, but in the end, I really couldn't do anything. Normally what I do is I plan for the next season. I get the bus schedules, I get the bus contracts, I get the schools, I get all of those things. And so much unknown was going on that we were all at a standstill, all at a standstill, not understanding what the future is going to bring. So the center was basically kind of in limbo, you know, and now that COVID's, you know, we're, we're, and coming out of it, there's actually tour bus companies, you know, rebooking with me and schools are coming in and, you know, it's starting to ramp up again, but we're nowhere near what we were pre before COVID for numbers, for interest. No. But we'll get you back there. Hopefully we can get some tourism students on a bus down there to visit you <laughs> in the future, right? Yeah. We got some big plans happening. That's great. Well, I mean, we're coming close to time, Heather. Um, did you want to share anything else with us before we conclude today's um, tour? No, just that I'm honored to be a part of this. Um, I hope you guys learned something and enjoyed what you were doing. This is my first time ever doing a virtual tour. Um, and as you could probably notice, the camera was going all wonky because it's backwards and what I'm seeing. So I was having a really hard time positioning it, but I hope you guys all enjoyed it. And I hope you guys do and are inspired to come here and, you know, talk to me, you know, and learn more from me. That was only a tidbit of what I know and what we can share. So, yeah, I thank you very much, Jennifer, to allow for allowing me to be a part of this whole whole thing. It's my honor. Well, the feeling is mutual. Um, my Mi'kmaq is not so good, but I do like to share a little bit when we open the meeting. Um, K's sound like G's, so I was saying Gwe to say hello, and is it Walalin that is thank you? Mm -hmm. Good, and I love the way that you um, in, integrated the Mi'kmaq language into your teachings and just the way you speak about everything. It, it seemed like you did that every day, honestly, the way you just did that tour, and um, yeah, we hope to have more um, engagements with you in the future, Heather. Uh, we can't thank you enough for supporting our program and the students in our program to help build awareness of our Indigenous communities. And uh, we just hope this, this is the start of a long journey together, um, helping create those Indigenous courses that will, will preserve and sustain the Mi'kmaq culture alongside of our Western mainstream culture that already exists here, right? Absolutely. So um, that's everything for us today. Um, I want to thank everybody for being in attendance and for your engagement. We had 62 participants um, mm -hmm. at this session, Heather, and that's a new record for us. Um, so uh, you obviously are doing something right. Keep up the good job. <laughs> All <laughs> thank right. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, and we'll see you back in classes. Enjoy your, your time this week, and um, we'll Alan. Bye-bye.